Okay, today I want to talk a little bit about isomers, but I'm going to talk about them in more of an inorganic kind of context or a general context. Um, chemistry has a number of different fields, and organic chemistry is around the study of carbon-containing compounds, and isomerism is incredibly important in organic chemistry. And while I'm going to use an organic molecule as an example um, today, because it does have carbon in it, it is one of our organic molecules, um, I'm really going to be focusing more on the structural side of things, which has um, both kind of implications in general as well as the organic kind of chemistry. So I'm looking at more of an introductory sort of level to isomers in general. So the prefix iso means the same. If you've studied some chemistry, then you've seen the term isotope, um, which means the uh, same number of protons. You know, it's the same element, but it has a different mass or a different number of neutrons. Or uh, if you've studied some math, isosceles triangles have two legs that are the same length. So that prefix iso means the same. Isomers then have the same stuff in them. They're made up of the same chemical elements, but we've put them together in some sort of slightly different way. So let's take this guy, um, C2H4Cl2. To think about the overall structure, we need to think about the total number of valence electrons, which is kind of bigger than maybe a normal inorganic compound, which is usually just made up of, you know, just a couple components, and there's not very many of them, but we have a 2 to 4 to 2 ratio here. So uh, my carbon has four valence electrons, right, if we think about its valence dot or Lewis dot structure. My hydrogen has one, my chlorine has seven, because it's in the halogens column, column 17 or 7a. So I have two of these guys, so two times my four gives me eight valence electrons. I have four of these guys, so four times my one gives me four. And then I have two of these guys, my chlorine, so two times my seven uh, gives me 14. So total, I have 26 electrons to work with. So the 26 total, uh, usually we'd say, well, okay, well, which ones should be at the center of the structure? And what we've seen pattern-wise is that the element that comes first is usually at the center of the structure. This also makes sense and jives with the idea that um, it's the one that wants to make the most bonds. I can't really have a hydrogen or a chlorine at the center because each of them only has one position, one place it can share an electron. Um, whereas the carbon has four. And carbon tends to be at the center of structures. So let's start off with two carbons that are bonded together. Now if each place that carbon can make a bond is a bond, right, so carbon wants to make four bonds, so they're attached to each other, and then that gives me three spaces on each that I could attach other things, if I'm kind of thinking about them like puzzle pieces, right, I'm going to take one and plug this in here, or plug one in here, plug one in here, then I have six things that I can do that with, so I can just kind of start plugging them in. Here's my hydrogens, and I'm just going, you know, clockwise. I started at kind of nine o'clock here and work my way around. Now the total number that I've used up in the bonds is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. So I've used up fourteen electrons which gives me 12 left over. And then if I look at my two chlorines here, they need some lone pairs. My hydrogens don't because they're happy with a full 1s, which is kind of that exception to the octet rule where eight is usually the magic number. And now I've used up two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 in my lone pairs. So I have no electrons left over. Okay, so here's my structure. This is a valid Lewis structure. It uses up all the electrons. It has all the component pieces. Everyone looks pretty happy, um, but there's another way I could put it together that would be slightly different. On this one, I have chlorines on each of my carbons, but I could also have both of these chlorines on the same carbon. So if I redraw this and put both the chlorines on this guy, and then put my hydrogens around, which essentially looks like if I would have started over here and instead of starting with my hydrogens, if I would have started kind of from the back working forward, then I, I'd say, oh, well, here's my two chlorines, and then I added on the rest of my hydrogens, and then the chlorines still need their lone pairs. So we're going to put those on. 
And this is also a valid Lewis structure. It has the same number of valence electrons. It has the same component pieces, but my chlorines are in different places. Now my chlorines are both on the same carbon on this one, and they're on different carbons on this one. So these are two entirely different molecules. They have two entirely different properties. Um, and actually, when you look at them, there's one of them that ends up being polar and one of them that ends up being nonpolar. And it's because of the positioning of these chlorines on the structure that allow it to happen. And in, in some cases with isomers, in many cases with isomers, there's one of them that's gonna form more readily than others, or you can tweak the conditions to have one form more readily than others. And so that's kind of another way we can think about kind of the utility of isomerism is really understanding what the product is gonna be. What is the potential for these? Um, how many different ways can I put them together? Well, um, you might be inclined to say, well, what if I was just to switch this to the top. So what if I was just to put my chlorine, one on this side and one on this side and everything else the same? And to our mind's eye, and maybe an untrained chemist, we would look at this and say, well, these two look like different structures, but they're actually not different structures. They're the same structure. It's just rotated around these single bonds. And single bonds, recall, have free rotation around them. So in 360 degrees, I can rotate all the way around. So I can hold onto this chlorine and rotate it around. I can rotate this bond in 360 degrees. And so if I rotate this and I just flip from one side to the other, or in this case, flip this side to the other, then I end up with this structure. I haven't taken it apart and rearranged it like I'd have to do here. If I was to try to make this one into this one, I can't just rotate it. I can't just flip sides. I have to physically take things apart and put them back together. And so that's how we know we have an isomer. If we're just rotating 360 degrees around single bonds, then this is the same structure. And if we visualize these using our VSEPR models, um, then we could see that these would ultimately be the same structures because we both have tetrahedrally coordinated carbons here. And so these guys are coming off at angles. I can make one look like the other easily without taking apart the model. So these two, not isomers of each other, not isomers, but these two are. So these two not these two are. And the the difference then is really just all about the rearrangement of the atoms, the rearrangement of chemical bonds. These are called structural isomers. It is the same pieces and parts, but I've put them together in a slightly different bonding pattern. So these are isomers of each other. Now you might say, well, um, I can think of other ways I could put this together. What if I put one of these chlorines at the center? So if I have a chlorine attached to another chlorine, and then I attach other things to that. So what if I did this? And then I have the carbons off to the side, and then I can put the lone pairs on the carbons. So what would be wrong with this structure? If you've done any sort of chemistry for any length of time, this should make you kind of cringe inwardly. But why? Why does it make you cringe? Well, it's really all about the periodic table. If we think about the periodic table and where the elements are, then our carbon here, and based on its um, Lewis dot structure, right, we're in column 14 or 4A, so we have our four valence electrons based on where chlorine is on the periodic table. We have our hydrogen kind of over here floating in the ether. So if we think about the position on the periodic table and these initial Lewis dot structures, then when you compare the initial Lewis dot structures and kind of the behavior that we would expect based on the periodic table to what it's doing in the compound, then this gives us information uh, uh, called formal charges. And I'm just going to give this, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but formal charges are a way that we can kind of test. It's a litmus test for a Lewis structure. Is this Lewis structure going to form or not? Well, if it has a lot of formal charges on it, um, which is really just the difference between what it wants to do on the periodic table and what it's doing in the compound. So I'll call that predicted behavior because we use the periodic table as a tool and, and as a guide. And so the periodic table 
um, is so powerful because it is predictive and because of the position of elements on the periodic table, we can see that, well, if carbon wants to make four bonds, but is only bonded with one thing here, it has no lone pairs and has three lone pairs here, that means that this is going to be kind of unhappy. That's an unhappy region. This is an unhappy region. If we think about our chlorines, our chlorines are happy with three lone pairs and one place it can bond. These chlorines have four bonds. So this is a place where it's not very happy. This is a place where it's not very happy. So there would be formal charges. And again, I'm not going to get into the calculation of them. They're not that complicated, but it just kind of goes beyond the scope of what I'd like to cover here. If I look at the difference between this chlorine and this one, there's obviously a difference. And so we don't like that, or it doesn't like that um, from an energetic standpoint. This isn't going to feel good. It's not going to do the behavior that it wants to do. And same with our chlorine here. There would be formal charges on each of these guys. There'd be formal charges on each of these guys, as opposed to this one, where if we compare it, we say, here's our chlorine. It has three lone pairs and one bond. Three lone pairs and one bond. That's great. The hydrogens want to make one bond. The hydrogens want to make one bond. Carbon wants to make four, wants to make four. So we're just kind of doing this benefit analysis. Is everyone benefiting in the way that it's expecting to, the way that it wants to, based on where it is on the periodic table? Then um, you can assign formal charges to that to determine, well, this isn't going to be a valid Lewis structure. I put it together and it has all of the right elements and it has all of the right number of valence electrons, but it's just not going to form this way. If it has the option to do other ones that are more in alignment with the behavior on the periodic table that the elements want, then that's going to be what happens. They're energetically more favorable. Okay, so if you have any questions on structural isomers, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I will talk to you again soon.